Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Non Secretary Nerds. Tonight, if there's something strange in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? Well, that's what we're here to answer tonight. Joining me, as always, is Ian. I'm Tim. How you doing tonight, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so, yes, as Tim said, we have just wrapped up, uh, well, not really just, but uh, we've wrapped up a fun-filled ghost-busting weekend. Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually went uh, went back up uh, home, uh, to the home area, uh, and hung out with Tim and his wife uh, for the entire weekend. Uh, and we went and saw Ghostbusters, including uh, seeing an old fan favorite of ours, Kevin, mm -hmm. uh, who decided to grace the world with his presence. He went outside for once, which... To be clear, isn't a pandemic thing. He just doesn't go outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, so we made good on our promise to see Ghostbusters, and we are going to give you our uh, fun-filled, spoilerific review mm -hmm. of the Busters of Ghosts. Yes. So uh, the real that Ghostbusters, again... if you will. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> ha! I can't see what you did there. For those of you uh, who are not aware. Uh, well, you can see Tim. I can't. His camera isn't showing up in our cat and in, uh, in our, our our call yeah. right now. So I, I don't, I don't I, know I'm why. Staring. So. I'm just staring at you know a picture. Uh, you know a still picture of his ugly mug. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you just, you just so, need to print that out and just put it on your monitor. Just me going <laughs> thumbs up. Yep. <laughs> right there. So there uh, yeah, if Tim's emoting or doing anything like that, I have no idea what he's doing. Uh, I just have to go by by vocal cues. So. Uh, yeah, I can tell you're doing that. Stop it. Um, anyway. How, how did yes, you know? Because uh, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, yes, uh, again, this is a spoilerific episode oh, yeah. of uh, Non Sequitur Nerds. Yep. So we will be going into some discussions about the movie, about yep. the plot, yep. about uh, fan theories, those kind of things, uh, as we go through and talk about this. So, uh, you know, this is your... Your only and final warning yep. uh, that this is a spoiler tastic episode. So you have uh, exactly five seconds uh, to pause, uh, go get a movie ticket, uh, go watch the movie, drive there, get some popcorn, get one of the really cool Ghostbusters tubs if you can find one, yeah. uh, maybe a, a, a cup, uh, whatever it is, you know, whatever merch that you want to get a hold of. Uh, come back and then turn us back on. Uh, we will be waiting. So here's your countdown five, four, three, two, one. All right, now let's get to the real meat and potatoes of yes, this episode. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, was a horrible movie. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, it was, it was awful, just direct. <laughs> I, I, just, I just don't know what that, like, I mean, I, <laughs> Plan 9 to Outer Space was better than this, than oh, just, than this schlock. Um, anyway. Zombievers was better. <laughs> 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 no, no, in all seriousness, like, we, we, we're just going to get this out of the way. We thoroughly enjoyed this film it was a mm -hmm. an absolute treat to go watch it yeah and you know um the movie's kind of in this weird i think there's a weird thing going on with pandemic films right now where um critics hate them and users love them yeah i mean uh, like eternals had it ghostbusters had it um i mean v venom 2 i don't think was as broad of a margin from critic to fan things at least on rotten tomatoes but like ghostbusters uh, when i saw before we went and saw the film it was sitting at a 95 percent fan rating and only like 30 or 40 percent critic rating but i have yet to talk to anybody even people that aren't like as big of ghost heads as i am i have yet to he hear anybody say like the movie was bad there were parts they didn't like but I have yet to anybody say hear anybody say the movie was bad, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's it's interesting how polarizing uh, things are. So you know, yeah. uh, Dune was actually less of a swing than most fe people figured. That was eighty two percent Rotten Tomatoes, ninety percent on uh, critics or uh, sorry, user score. Um, Ghostbusters is currently sixteen out of sixty two percent. So I think that's actually better than yeah, what it, I first saw. It went up because it was it was like. Maybe forty ish percent, but yeah, it's it's sixty two percent to uh tomato meter and ninety six percent audience score. So I mean that's mm -hmm. that's saying something. That's almost a perfect one hundred right there. Yeah, and as a as a larger polarizing gap, as an example, we mentioned it a moment ago. Eternals forty seven percent uh critics rating, eighty percent audience score. I saw Eternals. I actually really enjoyed it. Is it yeah. a great? Is it a perfect movie? No. Is it Endgame? No. Mm -hmm. Is it you know? Better than than Thor: The Dark World, absolutely. 
that, that doesn't take much. Let's let's call it how it is. Well, you know, <laughs> it was, it been, was it Wonder Woman 1984? Of course. Uh, yeah. Those of you that are longtime anyway. listeners know that we we were both saddened by Wonder Woman 84. Uh, at this point, I'm enraged and incensed about Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, anyway, so, uh, yes, uh, back to Ghostbusters. Um, really fantastic movie. All in all, I'm just going to go ahead and get it out of the way right now. All in all, I'd probably rate it an 8.5 out of 10 if I if I was going off that scale. Um, solid 85, maybe 90% for me. Okay. Uh, and I'm a little bit more critical than what Tim is. So, Tim, yeah. what's your score? Um, I, I would give it a, a solid 9 out of 10. Um, and and I, I would agree with the, the Rotten Tomatoes uh, audience score of a 96%. Um, really, not a perfect film, but a really, really good one. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was fantastic. It was a, it was a nice, um, callback to the original two Ghostbusters, uh, mm-hmm. Ghostbusters 1, Ghostbusters 2. Which, which um, and, and we will put this to bed right now for the people that complain that, oh, they didn't mention anything about Vigo or any of the stuff from Ghostbusters 2 really in the film. They're trying to decanonize it. No, Jason Reitman, the director himself, has came out and said, no, Ghostbusters 2 is canon. It This takes place in the same universe as the first two original movies. It is part of this universe. The movie wasn't about Vigo. So move past that. <laughs> yep. And, uh, he's you know, a Vigo. Also... <laughs> right. <laughs> um, along with that, you know, interestingly enough, uh, funding trivia for you several years ago, um, in the mid to, uh, 2010s, uh, era, I believe, <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody had asked, uh, Jason Reitman if, you know, he would ever, if he would ever direct a Ghostbusters movie. And he said, no, I, I mean, the short version is, was, no, I, I wouldn't do it. It's, it would be a very boring movie. It would be about, you know, guys sitting around talking about, like, ghosts. Like, that <laughs> that would be it. It would be extremely boring. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to touch and besmirch that, that legacy. But right. obviously something has changed. Well, he actually, um, and he, on, uh, uh, it might be what you're going to talk about. Yeah, he's also then quoted uh, the director of the Ghostbusters reboot with, uh, you know, the all-female cast, uh, Kristen Wiig, uh, Kate McKinnon, um, Leslie Jones, uh, Leslie Jones, uh, Melissa McCarthy, uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, inf- infragable uh, Thor, um, <laughs> uh, Chris Hemsworth. Yep. Uh, he's actually he's actually um, called back to that movie in interviews and, and thanked them uh, for you know all the bullets that they took. Basically, I think he actually said that in a quote. You know, thank yeah. you for all the bullets that you took because you kicked open the door that allowed us to make this Ghostbusters. Yeah. He called out the director, you know, Paul Feige b- by name, and thanked him. So, mm-hmm. so I mean, like, say what you will about Ghostbusters 2016. If that movie wouldn't have came around, we would not have gotten Afterlife. Yep. Might have gotten yep. something, but we wouldn't have gotten Afterlife. Yeah. Um. But, you know, again, it it was a fantastic movie. Like I said, it very much harkens back to the, you know, the spirit of the original. Uh, no pun yeah. intended. Right. <laughs> uh, the spirit of the original movies. Um. And you know was really it it didn't pander to fans Mm -hmm. i feel like it could have been you know it's obviously 30 years later yeah uh so you know it very easily could be its own kind of its own thing um you know just a couple of rewrite a couple of rewrites and changes and it really could be its own movie so it wasn't just like a carbon copy of the original ghostbusters it it didn't pander to fans um it it had just 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 the right amount of enough service yeah yeah, yeah, it had just the right amount of fan service. Um, you know, th- there were several times in the theaters where you know we, Tim and I would nudge each other. They, they did the thing. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> uh, so you know, it was it, it it spiritually again, no pun intended. It felt right. I mean, yeah, it just oh, absolutely it felt it, it felt right. I I, I agree a hundred percent. It's and I, I think uh, you had even made uh, it might you or Kevin one of the two on the ride home made the comment that uh, uh, Paul Rudd's character was effectively, you know, the Ghostbusters fans personified in the movie, because he's the one, he's constantly geeking out over all this stuff. And one of you made the comment that, you know, it was just the right amount of him doing that, that it it was humorous, but not enough to make it go, okay, we get it. This is a fan. We get it. It didn't, it didn't yep. you know, beat that dead horse home. Yep, exactly. Which, which is nice. I mean, the movie was very, very well balanced, all in all. Yep, 
So obviously, you know, we'd mentioned it before, directed by Jason Reitman, son of uh, the original director, yep, uh, Ivan Reitman. Reitman. Yep. Yep. Um, also has writing credits on this, along with Gil Keenan. Uh, not sure who that is, but, you know, just giving that giving credit where credit is due. Yep. Um, and then obviously some of the ancillary credits to, to Dan Aykroyd and the late legendary Harold Ramis himself. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, rest in peace, sir. Uh, you are a legend. Uh, so yeah, kind of getting into the movie itself, yep. um, you know, casting was really spot on. Like they did a fantastic job of casting. Yes. This movie. Yes. I mean, we, we did have, um, I mean, there's, there's some known names in there. Obviously, you know, Finn Wolfhard is, is a known name at this point. Um, mm-hmm. and I know a lot of people were worried when they cast him, they're like, oh, so it's Ghostbusters, Stranger Things. Because, I mean, unfortunately, Finn's kind of... I, I worry that this kid's going to get... And I say kid because he's, like, what, 16? Something like that, 15 or 16? Something like that. I mean, he's, he's, like he's a younger actor. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm worried that that kid is going to get typecast in, like, these supernatural oh, wow. kind of things. Huh. He was born in 2002, so that makes him... 19. What, 20? 19? Yeah. He'll be 20 next year. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, 19? He's still a kid. Uh... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know, but that being said, it didn't feel like it was his Stranger Things character in Ghostbusters. They definitely, they changed up his personality. They they definitely worked to his acting strengths in this, um, mm-hmm. playing an, an awkward teenager. Um, but it, it felt different. It felt unique. I didn't feel like any scene with him, I didn't feel like I was watching Stranger Things, which is, which is a, yeah. a good thing, because, like, I didn't want Stranger Things Ghostbusters. I wanted... Ghostbusters, plain and simple. And they did a fantastic job. I mean, not just him. I mean, obviously we had the, the ever amazing and immortal Paul Rudd uh, as Mr. Gruberson. Gary Gruberson is his full name. Uh, as the name's Gary Gruberson. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's one of the best jokes in the one of the better jokes in that movie. But uh, as the summer school <laughs> teacher slash seismologist that is in the town of Somerville, where the entire movie takes place. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's some other big names on there that I think people will be unsurprised that we mention, but we'll we'll get to those a little later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, all in all, none of the characters felt really out of place. None of them felt really um, oddly cast or anything. So, I mean, the main the main four uh, the main four is uh, you know uh, Callie, Trevor, and Phoebe, uh, who are. Uh, Callie being uh, the son, or sorry, son, daughter of um, uh, Egon uh, yep. from the original Ghostbusters, uh, estranged daughter of Egon, uh, with Trevor and Phoebe, played by Finn and McKenna Grace, uh, as the grandchildren um, that he really never got to know. Um, and <laughs> they play up, you know, they, they did a heck of a job with costuming for McKenna Grace, because she looks like she could be the granddaughter of Harold Ramis. Yes, my God. Like, I mean, she looks like spot on, like she could be a direct descendant of Egon Spangler. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was like the glasses, the hair, like her her clothes, the mannerisms, everything about it. They nailed it. Yep. Yep. So, you know, they did a, they did a, a pretty fantastic, uh, fantastic job in, in, you know, really, um, casting these characters and, you know, Callie uh, herself actually kind of reminds me of like a bitchier Vankman. Like she's very sarcastic, very sardonic. I mean, she's yeah. obviously very jaded because right. she's kind of had a hard life. Her dad kind of abandoned her, Yep. but she's just, she's sarcastic and just like wry and oh, bitchy. Um, right. You know, in a not an ov like and not an overbearing way. Yeah, but she's just snarky enough. To, she's just snarky enough to get away with it. Kind right. of much similar, I would say, to Venkman. Yeah. You know, Venkman had that that component of him. So you know, I guess they kind of cast their their Venkman uh, in this new one. And I would have to say that I would actually probably consider Paul Rudd the new uh, uh, Ray Stance. Oh, absolutely. And so I much, mean, you know, Ray's kind just, of that. that he's, geeky, he's the kid of the group. Yeah, he's the kid of the group. He's like, you know, the fanboy, like the, yep. the childhood excitement, you know, the, the whole sliding down the pole thing. Wow, did you guys check out this pole? This is great. 
you know, when can we move in. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, Paul Rudd at Gruberson has that same kind of childlike charm. Right. And well, then well, obviously... I mean, again, Paul Rudd's immortal. He's always going to have childlike charm, which which we right. dis- we discovered. You know, we, we went out to uh, we went out and grabbed some food uh, after the movie because popcorn will not sustain us as much as I wish it would. Um, Paul Rudd is only 19 years younger than Bill Murray. Let that sink in for a second. Put a picture of those two side by side. Paul Rudd is less than 20 years younger than Bill Murray. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, in a, it, it's interesting, actually, now that we kind of think about the, the, the top four, we've got Callie as as the new Venkman. We've got Paul Rudd or Gruberson as the new Ray Stance. Okay. We've got Trevor. I would say Trevor is the new Ernie Hudson in this, or the new, um, uh, sorry, Winston new Zeddemore. Well, yeah, because he's kind of the, he's the guy kind of sitting on the outside of all this because he's, he's not as, he doesn't have the personality of his mom. He's a little gruffer than, mm-hmm. you know, than, than, than uh, Gruberson. He's not scientifically inclined like Phoebe is. So, I mean, he's yeah, kind he's of more the, mechanically the, the, inclined. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's more the outside guy. He's the everyman. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then obviously we have Phoebe, who's cast as the spitting image of Egon. And yes. She is the, the spitting, you know, that that is who she is she is cast to be. So that's an interesting, interesting thing that, you know, yeah, we, I, we didn't I, talk about before, at, you know, post movie yeah. when we were kind of examining I, I it. I hadn't uh, even thought about that. Felt. Yeah. But, oh, um, good, good parallel for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we better make sure that we trademark that one. That's right. My theory. I can't. You know, I my that's mine. I came up with it. That's me. <laughs> all mine. Um, I helped. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you know, then, uh, yeah. The the movie, you know, kind of obviously shows off. You know, starts off with, you know, the short version, the death of of Egon. Yeah. As he's out in. BFE nowhere, Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, uh, really. Yeah, uh, what was it? Somerville, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. uh, land of nowhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, like know, I being... thought I had it bad here in Amish country. There's, there's at least some stuff to do here. Um, there's, let's see. Well, they have a Walmart, but I mean that's not saying much. Um, it, true. Um. <sighs> Yeah, so <laughs> you know, we on. see the moving on. Yeah, we <laughs> see the um you know, we see the the death of of Egon which kind of sparks everything. Yeah. Um you know, Callie uh, you know, Callie gets wind of her father's passing and you find out that their family's flat broke. Yeah. Uh she's actually getting evicted from her apartment. Yeah. Um as, which, as the yeah, movie is opening, she's getting evicted effectively like 5 minutes right. in. <laughs> right. Again, you know, those the that first opening scene really kind of sets their personalities because, you know, Callie's kind of trimming Trevor's hair and half paying attention. Again, kind of that sardonic personality, yeah. very, you know, very snappy wit. And and Trevor's kind of, you know, just trying to not get cut and gets cut. Uh, <laughs> gets cut. And Phoebe is taking apart the electrical outlets to try to get more current uh, to to run her lathe. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> which is a very egon thing. Yeah, no. Like and, the, and the again, power's it, not off. She's doing it while there's like there's still power going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um so, you know, they get wind, they drive out to to nowhere, uh Somerville and uh you know that kind of sets in sets in motion the rest of the rest of the movie yep. where you know uh you know Trevor gets uh, bit by the old love bug uh you know when he uh, sees a, another character a new character lucky uh this uh teenager who works at the local car hop uh which interestingly enough we had i think mentioned or talked a little bit about car hops this weekend and and then uh, also you know, they have the car hop, and they even make the joke in the movie that, you know, these places still exist. Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, like, I remember when I was younger, like, you could find places like that all the time, and now it's, like, few and far in between, and they're typically mom-and-pop shops. I mean, I know, like, like Sonic will... Some Sonics will still bring your food out to you, but I can't think of the last time I've seen anybody on roller skates doing it at any car Yeah. Hop. 
Yeah, like the true car op is kind of a thing of the past, I yeah. think. Um, the, uh, you know, there used to be one in uh, White Pigeon right near where I grew up. Oh, okay. um, and it, it changed hands probably like three or four times in the the 18 years that I really like lived in the area. Yeah. Um, pretty much after I went to college, I, I only really kind of visited the area. I didn't really live there anymore. Um, but yeah, I probably changed hands like three or four times. I think it's completely shut down now, but that was, mm. you know, more traditional car hop. I'm pretty yeah. sure they had people on roller skates oh, wow. when I was growing up. Yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah. So, and I don't remember the food. I guess it says something about that it. That says a lot about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. So he, uh, he immediately yeah. decides that I'm gonna I'm gonna apply here to get close to this girl. <laughs> yep. So that kind of sets some of Finn's personality. Uh, sorry, Trevor's personality, and I'm gonna keep doing that all night. Right. Uh, sets some of Trevor's personality uh, up, um, and you see Lucky being kind of you know the bit of a sarcastic, wise ass uh, type. Obviously, you know can obviously catching what he's throwing and yeah. uh kind of knocking batting those away right um so then uh you know phoebe uh winds up going to to summer school that's taught by mr gruberson uh, <laughs> who doesn't give a crap about summer school and yep. in point of fact actually blatantly says that <laughs> uh, he doesn't want to be there the kids don't want to be there and then he winds Moving up on. showing them like <laughs> he winds them showing he winds up showing them horror movies because yeah. he just has no desire to teach yep uh but th so. th this is also where you come to find out that he's mainly here because he's a seismologist. And Somerville, which uh, they say in the movie, isn't on any fault lines, there's no fracking, there's no volcanic activity, constantly is having earthquakes and has been having them for a while. One a day. Yep. At least one a day. Yep. And so he's there to figure out why, what, what is this? Um, which, of course, you know, Phoebe finds this out, uh, and is, she is immediately ecstatic about this. Uh, Gruberson's honestly amazed that a girl this young is that knowledgeable about all kinds of stuff and actually kind of starts sharing a little bit of his research with her. So you kind of start getting the, the, the uh, friendship built up there. So, yep. Which, which, and if we didn't establish it before, Phoebe is 12 in this movie. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Yep. So, uh, sorry, I thought Tim was going to take over oh, and start no. talking from oh, there. No, no, no. <laughs> like, like I, I just look at the camera and you're just like awkwardly staring and I'm like, did, did I miss something or, uh, Nope. I thought there was going to be a silent transition. Maybe this would work better if I actually had your camera feed up. Well, so. I mean, you know, sorry I, folks. Um, I, I turned it off and on again and it still didn't work. So I, I don't know what's going on. Did you kick it? The, the it's sword? All the up, it's all the way up. Kick it. It's all the way up there. And. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting and anyway, so but uh, this whole interaction with with Phoebe and Gruberson, uh, the beginning of it actually led off with a little bit of an interaction between Gruberson and her mom Callie, which leads into some some more stuff kind of down the road. Uh, while Phoebe is in class, though, she meets another one of the new characters, a young man named Podcast, because he makes podcasts, and Phoebe makes a joke like, "Well." Does everybody call you podcast? No, no, just just me. I like it. So you never actually learn podcast real name in the film. And yep. I, had, I had mentioned to Ian that I was really expecting someone there for uh, for somebody to ask, you know, what is your name anyway, kid? And him to say, you know, such and such Tully. And like maybe not even, you know, Lewis, you know, Lewis Tully from the first two Ghostbusters films. Maybe not even his kid. Maybe, you know, T you know, Lois, Lewis is his nephew. Or he's Lewis's nephew, excuse me, or, or something like that. Just a nice little throwback. Um, I'm going to get this out of the way. We did not get Rick Moranis out of retirement for this as much as everybody wanted him to be in there. Um, we did, however, prior to a few of these scenes, our first cameo, we got Annie Potts reprising her role as Janine Melnitz. Um, yep. Which I will say, she has aged very gracefully. Very gracefully. Oh, yeah. Annie Potts, is, Annie Potts is beautiful. Oh, yes, yes. she And, and an amazing actress as well. Um, but you find out that she had actually been managing Egon's estate, making sure the bills were paid when there was money to pay them. Um, and they... The kid's mom even questions, like, so you were his friend? And you kind of get... You kind of get a little bit, especially in Ghostbusters 1, obviously Janine had a thing for Egon, Ghostbusters 2, she went to Lewis. 
But you still, you kind of get, at least I did anyway, get the feeling that she still harbored, at the very minimum, a, a very deep friendship with Egon, but that yep. there was maybe something a little bit more there. But they, they never expand on that. They just leave it as, you know, we were friends. But uh, she was effectively his, his financier. She kept track of everything, paid his bills, made sure that, you know, he had the minimum that he needed to, to get by and keep the lights on. Which didn't yep, always happen. Survive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, the the uh, irreverent Annie Potts uh, also, you know, played uh, the voice of uh, Bo Peep in uh, the Toy Story movies. Yep. So. Yep. Uh, which I think we might have mentioned on here before, I, I, but yeah, uh, think, just in I case. Think so, yeah. yeah. Just in case. So, so she, she is quite versatile. Yeah, uh, and here's a little fun factoid for you. Uh, Annie Potts uh, made her film debut on the big screen in 1978 in a comedy film called Corvette Summer, okay. co-starring Mark Hamill. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> yes, and she was nominated for a Golden Globe for that role. Really? Well, like I said, yes. I mean, she, she's a, a good actress, you know? She yep. plays believable yeah. characters. Yep, and I feel a slight tickle on the back of my throat, so I'm going to mute my mic, and I'll turn it over to Tim to talk for a little bit while right. I try not to joke to death. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, after Phoebe meets Podcast, you know, he kind of explains that, you know, his show's about the supernatural, conspiracy theories, aliens, all this, you know, weird, out-there kind of stuff. Um, and he starts talking about how, like, she's they're walking through town, he's like, oh, that place is haunted, that place is run by the Illuminati, you know, lizard people, like, he mentions it all. And they end up at the local mine, where they used to mine for a material called selenium. Which, those of you that remember Ghostbusters 1, is what the girders in Dana's apartment building were made of after being designed by Ivo Shandor. This mine is where the selenium came from, and was owned by Ivo Shandor. So you're already, especially people that have seen the first film, you're already starting to see pieces fit together. So they go into the mine, and there's this weird carving on the wall. That, you know, it's covered by a tattered tarp, so you only get a few, like, glimpses of parts of it. But, uh, you know, there, there's all this mystery about it. The miners say it just appeared one day. People were jumping down a pit to their death. And, you know, Phoebe, this is the first time you see that she has one very different aspect than Egon. She does not believe in the supernatural at all. She thinks ghosts aren't real. She doesn't believe in any of that stuff. So she thinks that this is all just, you know, folk stories, ghost tales, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, it really kind of kind of sets up that there is something strange in this neighborhood. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I had to. Um, but, yeah, so in the movie, it, it, it very early on starts getting pieces together to make things fit. Now... If you hadn't seen the first film, had no knowledge of Ghostbusters, all this is just kind of like plot building, but you're not quite sure why. But again, for, for people that have seen the original one and recognize these things, you see, okay, Shandor built that building, Shandor owned this mine, okay, and Egon lived in this town. So it's like, all right. So it's, it kind of starts, gets the ball rolling, if you will. Yep. So, <clears throat> you know, you you kind of... I think those of you that can read between the squiggly lines on the TV uh, can probably figure out, you know, where this is going. Ivo, uh, Ivo Shandor, uh, Girders. Uh, we didn't mention them, but obviously, the, uh, but uh, the demon dogs or the terror dogs are are back. Yep. Uh, so you can kind of figure out where this is going. Yep. Uh, pretty quickly. But, uh, but 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 I will say though, the movie wasn't. We kind of had, you know, like you and I, at the least, kind of had an idea of where things were going, but I wasn't unsurprised by anything. It flowed very naturally. It didn't seem like they were shoehorning in the plot of Ghostbusters 1 into this movie, despite all the callbacks. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's it was, it definitely borrowed uh, uh, those plot elements, but it also really kind of moved to a, a component a new a new take on it, um, and a new componentization, and a new way to deal with it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, so... and they expanded on that lore a lot because they like if you watch the first movie, the guys didn't know that Shandor owned a mine and was getting the selenium himself. Like, yep. so, so I mean, they definitely built upon the existing lore in a very well done way. Very well done. Yeah, 
Yeah, and uh, you know, not to you know, we don't want to necessarily like, do a scene by scene of the yeah. of the movie for you. We don't. We want you guys to go and see it yourself. Oh, but um, you know, you know, they 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 borrow again some of those main story elements. The demon dogs, ter- sorry, terror dogs. Yep. Um, you know, get out and start. Uh, you know, doing kind of what they did in the first one. Yep. They are the gatekeeper and the key master. Yep. You know, you you know what what do you do with a key and a lock? They make yeah say they, they they make reference to that. those of you that can't see the video uh, put up yeah. one finger with one hand and make a hole with another. Um, they make reference to that in actually a very amusing way. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so um, and again, going jumping back to the casting, you know, uh, Callie and Paul Rudd play off of each other very well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Callie they, and Gruberson um, play off each other very well. They had so. very good on-screen chemistry. Absolutely. Yeah, and all of the all of the characters did. Yeah, uh, you know, very much so. Trevor and Lucky played off each other very well. Mm-hmm. You know, that that kind of quipping and back and forth and yep. and whatnot. And no one no one felt really out of place. Yeah. And then, you know, we did get introduced to uh, you know this new generation Slimer, which is Muncher. Yep. Um, which is a metal eating ghost. Uh, yeah. Short fat thing that actually kind of reminds me of uh, the caterpillar from a Bug's Life. Kind yeah. of, actually. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we get to see them. Uh, you know, you kind of get to see, you know, how all of it flows together and works. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, experience some of the new the new and interesting ways that they do that. And also, again, those callbacks to the original. Right. And speaking of callbacks, we can't talk about the callbacks without talking about the tech. Yes, absolutely, yes. So, you know, Tim's going to gush over this a lot cuz yeah. I I yeah. haven't built a I haven't built 15 proton packs like he has. I've only built um, 3 and possibly working on a fourth. Um <laughs> But no, it's it, it was nice to see particularly at at Egon's farmhouse uh throughout the movie Phoebe finds more and more of the old ghost busting tech. Um like, she, you know, they find a trap, which the trap, apart from looking weathered and kind of beaten, but I mean, again, it's they're old, looked pretty much the same. Um, she finds, like, Egon's personal proton pack, which, if you look at it, I mean, there there are stills online that you can see. Um, Hasbro actually is currently doing a, a HasLab, uh, effectively a Kickstarter thing, for a 1-1 replica of the new pack. So, I mean, you can even see from that that it's had a lot of work done on it. I mean, it's it has been modified, it has been repaired, um, but you do get those callbacks. But you can they do a good job of establishing that this is tech from the that they built from the eighties. Yep. It's gonna need work. It's gonna need some rebuilding. It's gonna need replacement parts. And even amongst like people that build proton packs as props for hobbies. A lot of the parts that were on the original pack, like they were all off the shelf stuff that the prop makers built, built or uh, bought, excuse me, to build the packs. Some of those companies don't even exist anymore. Some of those parts, they don't, they haven't made for years now. So it's nice to kind of see that reference in the film. Like, not, they didn't directly say, oh, well, this particular actuator they don't make anymore. But just looking at it visually, they did, they did change it. They did modify it. I mean, even his, uh, the Neutrona wand. Which is the part that shoots the stuff out of it? <laughs> like you see, the, exactly. You see that the, the handles are different on it. Um, so it, it was kind of nice to to get a yeah, modern the, uh, re- the, rendition. The handle kind of looked like a the handle kind of looked like a shotgun stock. Yeah, now. I, yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> I, it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which was always kind of like you know again the the original in the very original Ghostbusters you you armed it by twisting it right. Yes. So that that was kind of like shucking the shotgun from back in the day, you know. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, see, one um, th- one thing, and this, this is, believe it or not, this is my biggest gripe with the movie. You do see the ecto goggles again. They've been upgraded, and I say upgraded in a very loose term, to take Polaroids of whatever you're looking at. <laughs> you you mainly just see podcasts messing around with them. But you don't actually, at least in the first film, like you saw it from Ray's point of view, what you know, what are you seeing through the goggles? They really didn't do much with them. I, I think uh, there there is a scene later on where 
you do get to see a new version of the trap, which is the the remote controlled trap, which mm -hmm. you and I talked about this. I want to know what kind of RC car that thing's powered on because it's outrunning the Ecto when the Ecto's doing almost seventy. <laughs> yep. I mean, and it can turn on a dime. Like I want that kind of remote control car, but um, it, it does almost seem like in that scene you see podcast operating it, and he still has the goggles on. So I'm wondering if the goggles do have some kind of video feed from the trap so you can see where you're going if it's too far at a distance. Because it did have, it looks like a, a flashlight or maybe it was a camera uh, aperture mounted to the side of it, if you noticed. So I'm wondering if the goggles also connect to that so you can see what the trap sees so you can see where you're driving. Maybe, I don't know. But it, it didn't seem like the... I mean, obviously we'll get into it later, that the traps had a huge presence in the film. The proton packs obviously are going to have a huge presence but the the goggles didn't really even even the pke meter had a lot of importance in the movie the goggles were it had kind a lot of, of importance kind of there. it had a lot of it had a lot of upgrades to it uh, you know it, it's a taser now it's a it's a ghost taser yeah um sorry i had, so, to, I had know, to pull mine out again <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 you're fine. That's that's a thing. Uh, so yeah, that that's a thing. You know, the PKE meter is is now a ghost taser, um, which is yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, and I had one of those PKE meters when I was a kid too. Um, you know, I had one of the proton packs. I yeah. had one of the, the the wands and everything. Yeah. I I, di I never I didn't have like the little uh, foam noodle that you could put in the wand <laughs> that, that though, everybody to, to lost because their dog chewed it up. Yeah, yeah, yep. that thing. Yep, I know exactly um, what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a trap, and I so lovingly uh, bequeathed it to uh, my best friend. Yay. Uh Because his his grandpappy smashed the crap out of his. <laughs> and to, to be fair, I left it out when I was a kid in the middle of the living room in the dark, didn't pick it up, and he came out in the middle of the night and stepped on it. Got mad that he stepped on it because he crushed it, and then kicked it and crushed and smashed it some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 so um yeah so you know the the tech uh the tech has obviously gone through some changes and some updates and things like that uh so you know it it's looking it's looking really interesting and cool and obviously we can't talk about the tech without talking about the big cadillac in the room the ecto one yes yeah which i mean I'm not going to lie, it hurt me a little bit to see that, that beautiful, beautiful machine in such disrepair. Yeah, but I mean, that kind of, I mean, that was the whole, I mean, well, okay, let's admit, when it first rolled into, rolled into the firehouse in <laughs> Ghostbusters 1, it was shape. in, it was in even worse yeah. shape. This at least still had uh, most of the original, or most of the paint on it, so. <laughs> right, uh, Mr., you know, memorization here, can you name all of the parts that Ray said that needed to be replaced on the Ecto-1 oh when gosh. he first rolled it in? Um. Like the shorter list would be what parts didn't need replaced, honestly. Um, we'll see yeah, shocks, I think it was like struts. electrical shocks, struts, uh, wheel bearings, brakes, brake pads. But it was calipers, only forty-eight hundred. Uh, <laughs> transmission. Yeah, I mean, um, pr pretty I... much, he was gonna have to completely rebuild the car and maybe use part of the body. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. it was it was in pretty rough shape. Only forty-eight hundred. <laughs> Yeah, only forty eight hundred. Back nice. in nineteen eighty four, he got ripped off. Um. Anyway, so yeah, the uh, the uh, the Ecto one uh, is in it. It's back. Uh, plays a pretty big role in the film. Yeah. Uh, it's gotten some upgrades. Mm -hmm. uh, some upgrades that we never saw in the movies. Yep. So I mean, uh, like the the biggest one, and you see it during a lot of the trailers, but the biggest one was the slide out gunner's door. Um, which was was pretty cool. You you see you get to see Phoebe use that as her chasing muncher through the town of Somerville. Um, you also get to see a a effectively a drop down door for the aforementioned RC trap that's in the car. A panel opens up and a little uh ramp slides down so you can let the RC trap out from inside the vehicle. Which makes a lot of sense you'd have that, especially if, if you're using that trap in conjunction with the gunner seat to chase a mobile ghost you're going to need a way to get that trap out, not just chuck it out the window and hope for the best or lean way out and drop it on the ground out your window. So it was, it was they both made sense that they had both of those particular upgrades. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's. Again, you know, it's nice callbacks to some of the other extended canon, extended universe type stuff like the real Ghostbusters, obviously, because, you know, the 
the sidecar seat ever was featured in the movies, but it was featured as part of the real Ghostbusters yep. and in the toy in the Ecto One toys uh, based uh, that came from that. Yep. And and speaking of the toys, uh, I didn't know if you uh, if you knew this. In one of the scenes, a little bit farther on in the movie, where you start seeing a bunch of ghosts all coming out and appearing in uh, Somerville, you see a ghost where it's just, you just see an eyeball pop out, and then the rest of the ghost comes with it. You remember that one? Yes. Okay. Yes, that, I do, actually. That ghost is actually a ghost from the real Ghostbusters toy line. They canonized it just for that one little, like, two-second scene. But they, they, they flat out <laughs> said that that is that, that particular ghost toy. Yeah, and they I mean, I mean, there there are you know also other callbacks. I mean, obviously they put out that uh, that scene, that kind of teaser scene showing the uh, the Stay Puff, the mini Stay Puff Marshmallow Men who are, let's see, skewering each other, cooking each other, melting chocolate on each other, putting each other in blenders, riding a Roomba, uh, and generally being a Gremlins level nuisance. Um, but you do also see later on there's a a spray painted like marquee on the side of a building, excuse me, for Stay Puff Marshmallows. So they, they do kind of they do kind of uh, honor that as well. You don't get to see Mr. Puff in all of his you know two hundred foot glory, but you do get his right. his, his spawn. <laughs> yep, and they do kind of have a fun. Uh, at least we theorize it's a fun call out to um, Paul Rudd's character in Ant Man. Uh, in that, <laughs> yep, you know, Paul uh, Gary Gruberson goes to Walmart and gets Baskin Robbins ice cream. Then um, I even remember I, I leaned over in, uh, in the theater and said, "Ian, there's thirty one flavors." <laughs> 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 yeah so um the movie had a lot of really really subtle call outs and again we said this before it wasn't very ham it wasn't really ham-fisted in its fan service there was there was obviously the overt stuff i mean it's ghostbusters for crying yeah. out loud it, it i mean if, if the you, fact that if it was made came, 30 a sequel yeah. was made 30 years later in and of itself is a is a fan service call out exactly i um, mean and, and you can't change too much about it otherwise the longtime fans will be upset but you can't put too few new of new things in it otherwise the fans will be upset so you've, you've got to find right. that, that that perfect balanced line and i think they nailed it i think they absolutely nailed it yeah this is a great way to get new people into a series because it wasn't like it was Ghostbusters, but it's not like terrifying. Like I'd be okay with my kids seeing this movie. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like my daughter like, was actually upset that I went and saw it without her. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know, no, again, no offense to the the 2016 Ghostbusters. Yes, was that? Yep. Was that it? Yeah, the 2016 go, uh, all female cast led Ghostbusters. That one was a little bit darker. Um, dealt with death a lot more right like like actually having people on screen die um so but this one really kind of avoided that you know yeah. it, it well it had you, it had you, fun I mean, you did it, see what one, one major death <laughs> but we'll, we'll probably talk about that here in a second <laughs> yeah but let, we'll just say that, that that was was not a human we'll call it a ghoul i guess yeah or that it's it's something that i hope that they explain they expand on that a little bit because i have questions i have questions <laughs> yeah so um anyway you know we've been kind of we've been talking about the, the tech and we've been talking about the setting we've been talking about the movie and all this other stuff but you know obviously we kind of get to the the climax of this whole thing where we see um you know, uh, the, the, our two main adult cast members, uh, Gary and Callie, wind up getting possessed by the demon dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to make demon puppies, uh, <laughs> and they ultimately sh uh, they ultimately summon uh, the demon houndmaster. Um, I think he's trying to bang your mom. <laughs> doesn't that disgust you? I process my emotions internally. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a great scene. Such so, great scene. yes, internally I'm throwing up. <laughs> anyway you'll, you'll um, get what we uh what we mean when you see the film <laughs> exactly so yeah they you know they they obviously it was probably one of the best kept worst kept secrets of the movie you right. know besides the besides the other thing that we're going to talk about i'm here yeah. soon i'm sure yep um you know i i i think uh they um you know they did a, a they they obviously summon summon uh gozer Gozer, Gozer the Gozerian. Gozer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I am so, Gozer? Yes, I am Gozer. 
<clears throat> so uh, they summon uh, Gozer, uh, who uh, looks uh, the character character design on Gozer is fantastic. Uh, yes, looks it's gotten a, a very very much needed upgraded look. I like upgraded look. Gozer's upgraded look without looking out being... of place. Yeah, without looking out of place. Yeah, like it's yeah. it's. I mean, the first Gozer, like, <laughs> I've seen people go to cons, cosplay as Gozer, and they literally just get bubble wrap, throw a little bit of glitter on it, put it down as a bodysuit, and, and it works. The new Gozer looks, apart from the face, looks more otherworldly. It looks like weird skin scale spike things. It's it's definitely a good upgrade to the look of Gozer. Um, and this was something that didn't get revealed until the movie premiered. Gozer was actually played by two people, one for the voice, one for the body. The body, and she is uncredited for whatever reason, was played by Olivia Wilde. So it was a nice... What a body. Right? <laughs> I'll, I'll be her key master. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, um, but, yeah. So, I mean, that was, it was... And, like, they got the look of Gozer. They nailed down that look, down to the flat top. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and was very, very well done. And the voice of Gozer, um, I think I was probably the only one in the theater to recognize it right <laughs> I away. Think so. uh, you know, I heard, I think they spoke all of two lines. Uh, and then I, I recognized the voice as uh, Shori Ag- Agdashlu. Um, for the, those of you who don't have it, which is probably most of you have any idea who she is. Uh, she's, uh, you know, kind of a more niche actress. Um, so you, you kind of have to know where to look for. Her. She's in the expanse, uh, plays a, uh, I think a fairly large character in the expanse, um, lately, but, um, also provided the voice, uh, of, um, uh, a voice of a very prominent character in, uh, the mass effect universe, one of the admirals, uh, and, um, uh, Tali Zora's uh, godmother, so to speak. Uh, so she features very prominently in that, and she also plays the voice of Lakshmi 12 in uh, the Destiny uh, video games. So there I'm very familiar with uh, very familiar with her and her voice acting and uh, some of her some of her appearances. But uh, does a fantastic Gozer. Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Take takes that wispy raspiness of the original 1984 Gozer and sets it up a whole nother level yes. because her voice is naturally really raspy. Like yes. it's just, she just has this natural, like sounds like she's gargled sandpaper kind of voice, <laughs> right? but it's but amazing. It works. It's it so works. distinct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, say in, in Gozer's, you know, when Gozer manifests fully in this, that, that leads to another cameo, which is the aforementioned major death that we had talked about that you see on screen. Um, with the, I mean, e- Egon's death you do see on screen, but it wasn't really graphic. This this was, it almost seemed out of place for a Ghostbusters movie, but I laughed at it. You see, when right. the kids are in this, they find this underground secret temple to Gozer, and they see sitting in a uh, in a glass ca- uh, casket is the body of Ivo Shandor. Well, as the spirits start coming out, you kind of see its its eyes open up. It looks at podcast. But then you know, the the spirits all go back down. Go, well, when Gozer finally comes out, the spirits all burst forth, wreck the glass container, and Shandor pops up out of it, played by J.K. Simmons, which was not yep. a cameo I was expecting in this movie. <laughs> but you see him, he's like, oh, my my goddess, my queen, I have done all this for you. I am here to serve. And then Gozer just cuts him off mid-sentence and literally rips him in half. <laughs> And I gotta admit, yes, like, not like, 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 like you don't see like bifurcate, like, just are, like she, peels him like a banana. Yeah, he was a zipper. I mean, but yes. like, I, like it did, like there wasn't like it wasn't Quentin Tarantino like blood blah, everywhere. But I mean, it was definitely she just ripped a dude in half, and I had to actually stop. I laughed at that. I like because it was just so. Oh, I think the whole theater laughed. I, yeah, just I did all of this for you, my queen, so that you may rule. <laughs> No, we have two J.K. Simmons. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, two for one deal. There we go. Um, yeah, so a uh, real quick callback to uh, uh, Shore. Um, she in uh, Mass Effect plays the character of Admiral Shalaran Vastonbe, uh, for okay. those of you that were that are trying to place her character. Gotcha. There we go. So, yeah, so, you know, Gozer the Gozerian, the big bad of the movie, back and, you know, uh, causing... <laughs> 
yeah, back pissed, causing trouble. Um, you know, and the kids are obviously getting into more trouble. Yep. Uh, you know, trying to to stop Gozer. Yep. Uh, so you know, they manage to trap one of the demon dogs and uh, terror terror dogs. Sorry. Yep. Um, what they did establish uh, in this is that the the terror dogs are actually the her guardians. His they they Gozer's They're, guardians. <laughs> Yeah, the Gozer's Guardians. Yep. Uh, so some of her power is, like is derived. Army? I think so. Okay. Uh, some of her power is derived from from the demon dogs itself, uh, yep. at least within the physical, the material world. So yep. for, when for they her to manifest, planning... they have to they have to both be there, opening the gate in, together. If one of them is removed for whatever reason, Gozer can't fully manifest. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, so the kids managed to capture one of the demon dogs through some uh, some clever subterfuge and terrible dad jokes. Oh my god. Um, like, throughout the entire movie, Phoebe is telling just the worst dad jokes ever. But you hear every dad in the theater. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and you hear all the kids in the theater. Ugh. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, what, so... what was the one you said you needed to remember? Um, now I don't remember it. I know, um, me either. Was it, one with the, was it the one about the hamster? Yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, what, uh, um... Oh, I, I remember, okay. Oh, yeah, what, 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 what do a what hamster do a... and a cigarette have in common? They're both harmless. Know, what do? Oh, they're both harmless until you put them in your mouth and light them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad that it's good. <laughs> and it's delivered in, in Phoebe's just deadpan style, too. So Yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 for those old fans out there, imagine Egon telling jokes. Yes, so. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, one of her early jokes is, uh, uh, why can't you trust Adams? Because they make everything up. <laughs> but um, that's an Egon joke, if I ever heard it right there. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, anyway, the kids manage to capture one of the uh, terror dogs and uh, uh, go back to the old farmhouse where they have discovered along the way is that what Egon has done is he has turned uh, a field, a small field, like a, you know, like a... Uh, like what, a, a quarter a acre? Plot. Yeah, not, probably not even that. Like okay. a crop plot, really. Yeah. Um, into what is essentially a giant trap. Yeah. And when I'm not, I'm not talking about like, you know, like a, a pitfall trap. I'm talking about the Ghostbusters trap. Yes. It is a ghost trap. Literally, the field uh, is lined with uh, just dozens of the regular ghost traps that are all designed and powered to work in tandem to be able to capture something much more powerful than what they could normally. Right. So uh, they escape back to the house after freeing uh, uh, Callie. Uh, and, uh, you know, Gozer and the remaining demon dog, uh, who is the gate, uh, key master. Yep. The key uh, master. Yep. The, yep. Comes they, after they captured them. the, the gatekeeper. Yep. Yes. Uh, comes after them and, um, through, uh, this is, uh, you know, they, they try their best to, to, uh, to, uh, set off the trap, but, um, they have an issue with, uh, power, uh, and capacity. Uh, and so, um, Gozer kind of makes it through, or at least makes it into the middle of the field with nothing happening, and yep. uh, you know attacks everyone. And this is where we get the true fan service callback. Now, and I will uh, say that, that all of this was set up because prior in the film, the kids actually got arrested for joyriding through town in the Ecto with no license, and shooting up the town with laser beams. I will proton streams, but Phoebe, no sa Phoebe says, "I want to make a call. I get one call, right?" And Who are you gonna call? Exactly. <laughs> we get that line, which I looked. I looked over at Ian in the theater. And said they said the thing, <laughs> but she, from having prior learned of the Ghostbusters, she sees their old TV ad with their phone number. She calls it, and none other than Ray picks up at Ray's occult. So the the old Ghostbusters phone number is his bookstore or his occult store's phone number now. She yep. kind of asks him all these questions about the Ghostbusters, and I, I won't spoil too much of this part. But you get a little bit of, you know, backstory of what happened between the 80s and now. Where, Why did everybody go their separate ways? And the one thing that you do need to know, why Egon kind of went off on his own, is Egon knew that there was something going to happen in this town. He, you know, did his research, but it kind of made him even more eccentric than he already was. And because of some, some falling outs, the other three, well, all four of them went their separate ways. And they just kind of, you know, 
they felt that Egon abandoned them as well. Yep. Well, so because of that phone call and everything, you get the big cameo that ever the big cameos that everyone was waiting for in this scene. You see none other than Venkman, Stance, and Zedmore showing up to save the day one last time. The seven year old their gear. Yep. Wearing their old jumpsuits, mm-hmm. wearing their old proton packs. Yep. And damn, was it a beautiful scene. Oh my god, was it ever. Was it ever. Yep. And, you know, it's not... And again, it's not like ham-fisted over the top. The go- the original Ghostbusters swoop in and save the day, and, and, it, and they're the heroes again. It's... They're supporting cast members. Like, they're... Yeah. Absolutely. They they're not they're not the main focus here. They're a distraction. Yes. Uh in, in perpetuity. Uh so, you know, they try to take down Gozer and doesn't quite work. Um well, and, and, and I, again, we we talked about this a little bit um amongst ourselves, but we didn't mention it here. One of the things that they show in the movie is that ghosts can break the beams. Yeah, you see Muncher literally earlier in the movie as he's, you know, tangled up, grabs it bites it and severs the stream, which in the movies anyway, we've never seen a ghost do that. Gozer in this scene does something that I think anyway is a little bit more impressive. When the, you know, the original crew shows up, the remaining three anyway, they're, you know, they immediately go and cross the streams because that's how they stopped Gozer last time. Well, Gozer literally grabs the streams and un- uh, like uncrosses them by hand. And it literally, like, you see the the guys, you know, they've got their everything out, and you see them, like, shaking, trying to pull them back, but they're being forced back by Gozer, who is manipulating the proton streams, which was really cool, and I did not expect that at all. Yep. So, you know, I I was rather impressed by that. Yeah, Um, absolutely. You know, and then this is where we see the main cast, you know, kind of jump back in and start taking over again. Uh, you know, uh, Phoebe is really fighting with Gozer, you know, one-on-one at this point. Yeah. Um, at this point. <laughs> you know, yep, one-on-one at this point. You know, everyone else is kind of knocked to the sidelines, and uh, uh, Trevor uh, manages to get his proton pack working, which uh, we didn't mention it, but um, the Stay Puffed have shown up again and are starting to sabotage everything. Yep. Uh, so uh, Podcast is trying to deal with them, and... Uh, uh, Trevor gets his uh, gets his proton pack working in and winds up not shooting Gozer, yep. but the capacitors. Because again, you have a miniaturized particle accelerator on your back. Uh, yep. That thing shoots out some wattage. Yeah, it's shooting out pure protonic energy. <laughs> yeah. So charges up the charges up the capacitors, which lets them open the traps and. Just like uh, my roommate in college's uh, girlfriend uh, really sucks and pulls in all of the ghosts, including. Gozer the Gozerian? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes including Gozer the Gozerian. So, uh, do, do we want yeah, to, so do the... we want to talk about the big one? Uh, you know what? No, you know, let's this... let's, let's not. Yeah, let, let's, let's let's not let's let, let's leave that one to you guys. There's there's more to this scene than what we are telling you, and I feel that it would be doing this movie a disservice to explain more of the backstory of this scene. Normally, yeah. normally on our spoiler episodes, we go all out, give you everything. I feel it would be doing a disservice to this film to give you everything. Yep. So. So you know. Also, you know, we'll keep it uh, keep it brief here. There are after credit scenes. There's actually yes. two of them, mm-hmm. uh, mid credit and an after credit scene. We yep. suggest you stick around for both of them. They yeah. both have some pretty important points to them uh, yes. and very poignant poignant points uh, in the movie. Absolutely. So, um, but uh, yeah. So ultimately, fantastic movie. Great mm-hmm. shout out to uh, Jason Reitman uh, and uh, the rest of the crew cast crew and all of those who were involved uh, to make this movie because it was absolutely. fantastic oh absolutely it, and again doesn't is not a ham-fisted uh fanboy surplus uh you know just fan servicey schlock it yeah. is uh an actual you know legit movie uh that uh 
you know, could be could stand on its own with just a couple of minor changes. You don't need to be. And I guess that was another thing we didn't really talk about. They 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 talked enough about the original Ghostbusters that you really could go into this without having seen the originals. And oh, I, I think yeah. be okay. Absolutely. I mean, it's it would have stood well enough on its own that even had it not been as much involved with the first film as it was, which was the perfect amount, I still would have gone into it and really enjoyed it. So. Yep. So. I would, I would, I would agree. There we go. <laughs> so, um, well, is there anything else to say about it other than go see it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, go see it. I mean, if if it is safe to do so, where and who you are, absolutely go see it. If not, they've already started, you know, kind of laying the groundwork for the at home release of it, which I anticipate will probably. They haven't set a date on it. I anticipate probably early twenty twenty two. Might may maybe if we're lucky we'll we'll get a pre Christmas release on it. I I don't think so though. Um, the movie so far is is doing better than was anticipated in theaters as far as financially, um, which is definitely a good sign for this film. But I think as more word of the movie gets out and more people hear about how good it really is, I think you're going to see this film just continue to grow, which is an absolute amazing thing to see. Yep, I would uh, I would agree with you there. Um... Very, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see this uh, movie again um, uh, in in hands and not just on illegal streaming sites uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, be able to enjoy it at, uh, in the safety and comfort of our own homes, curled up with a, a hot cup of uh, a cup of hot chocolate flavored with your favorite Stay Puft marshmallows <laughs> um, or a nice, cool, refreshing glass of Ecto Cooler. Which I am sad. More they didn't bring back in mass production for this. I have a several. Says the person that has twelve boxes of Ghostbusters cereal. Eleven now. I ate one. I I also have a a full sixteen case of Ecto Cooler cans from the twenty sixteen re release of it unopened. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not opening them. Uh, Mostly I because I I hate to imagine how they will taste at this point. Uh, yeah, the, probably. Ooh, yeah, I don't know. not good, not good. But no. So, anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So go see it. the movie. Yeah, I think that'll do it. That'll do it for us. So go see the movie, uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, in theaters now, uh, or was, depending on when the, the you are uh, watching or listening to this. Uh, if it is not in theaters anymore, check it out on your favorite streaming platform. Go rent it from Redbox if that's still a thing uh, at this point, um, or you know, however you consume your media. It's mm -hmm. uh, highly, you know, fantastic movie. I Absolutely. highly suggest it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, with that, I think that will do it for us tonight on this spoiler-tastic episode of Non-Sequitur Nerds. As always, uh, thank you to Anchor.fm, our podcast hosting platform, uh, who feeds out to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, several other podcast providers. Uh, also, thank you to YouTube, where you can find our video recordings of this. Um, uh, just search uh, non sequitur nerds and you will find us. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also find us on social media, uh, twitch.tv slash non sequitur nerds. Uh, we do live stream these uh, occasionally. Yeah. Um, if we do these on our usual recording time, uh, you can also find us on Twitter at non sequitur nerd. Uh, no S on that, uh, due to the character limitations of Twitter. Uh, we do post updates there from time to time, uh, memes, media, uh, updates. Uh, we will announce if we are doing, if we are or not doing a live broadcast that week. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, uh, slash facebook.com slash non sequitur nerds. Yep. So, uh, um, I think that takes care of all of my shilling for now. I think so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, with that, uh, we will let you uh, go for the evening, and uh, we hope that you will call upon us soon. <laughs> <laughs> you can't uh, see it, but I'm shaking my head. Uh, yeah, I, I assumed as much. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, uh, have a fantastic uh, day, uh, morning, e noon, evening, good night, uh, whatever it may be. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, so for Non-Sequitur Nerds, I'm Ian. And I am Tim. Y'all have a good night. <laughs>